Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm so excited because we have a very special guest today. We have Sarah McDonald here, and she has an amazing story to tell. And I'm going to just give the stage to her because I want her to tell you herself. I don't want to have to waste any more time. So Sarah, why don't you tell people a little about yourself and your story and tell them, you know, this is such an inspiring story. It just makes my jaw drop and tears come down my eyes. So go ahead. Take it okay. away, babe. <laughs> Stacy, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. So yeah, so I'm I'm Sarah McDonald, and I am a two-time cancer survivor who has recently written a book called The Cancer Channel. And The Cancer Channel tells the story of when I was newly promoted at work and newly married, and I was going through fertility treatments to try to get pregnant with my first child. When I received a rare cancer diagnosis and it kind of came out of nowhere. I uh, went to the dentist and a week later I found a lump in the floor of my mouth and I said to the dentist, hey, did uh, you know, maybe during my cleaning, uh, I maybe got um, an infection and, and so she said, please come in immediately. And fast forward after many, many doctors and biopsies, we discovered I had a rare form of cancer called adenoid cystic carcinoma, which Stacey is really just, I, I like to say, badass salivary gland cancer, which oh, of wow. course you've never heard of, like no, no one you know has ever had it because it's just super rare and incurable, unfortunately. So that was the first cancer diagnosis. And then two months later, after I had had my uh, surgery for the uh, salivary gland cancer, I was speaking with my head and neck oncologist and said, you know, hey, I have this lump in my breast that I that I had biopsied about six years ago. Is it possible that it's actually metastatic salivary gland cancer? And he said, Sarah, you already have one of the most rare forms of cancer there is. And when it travels, when it metastasizes, it goes to your lungs or your brain you know, which Stacey made me feel great. Yeah. Um, but I said, okay, so salivary gland cancer doesn't go to the breast. He said, no, if you have cancer in the breast, it's probably breast cancer. He said, but Sarah, the chances of you having two unrelated cancers at the same time, you know, we just never see it in someone so young, but right. if it would make you feel better, you should pursue it. So Stacy, I went back to my doctor and, you know, uh, spoiler alert, at this point, I had stage three breast cancer, and oh, actually one of the most common forms of breast cancer. So two cancers at the same time, obviously, wow. maybe not so obviously, that put our fertility dreams on hold um, for the year while I went through cancer treatments. And um, the, the book actually talks about or kind of share, I try to share the lived experience viscerally of a cancer patient. Wow. So that's, that's me. I'm a new time author and my day job, I actually work at a startup. You know, I live in Northern California. Of course I work at a startup and I'm an executive coach. So that's what I do beyond writing books. Wow. That is an amazing story. It's, it's just jaw dropping when, you know, when I read about it and now that you tell me, you know, and face to face, it's just, it, it just amazes me. How did you feel when you were diagnosed, when they say those words to you, you have <laughs> cancer, you know, that, you know, it's, it's such a, a scary term and nobody wants to hear that with the big C word. Right. How did you feel? What thoughts went through your head at that moment? Yeah, it's, it's really hard to adequately describe how it feels. But as I explained to a lot of people, it was as if someone turned on a knob, a channel in my head that played, I have cancer, I have cancer, I have cancer. Um, it was kind of like the all cancer all the time channel, which is why I called my book the cancer channel. Right. Um, but, you know, Stacey, when someone hears that they have cancer, um, for many people I have spoken to, it becomes kind of a line of demarcation in their lives. There's the life before their cancer diagnosis, and there's the life after their cancer diagnosis. And it feels remarkably different, in part because you are brought face to face with your mortality, which right. sounds heavy because it is. Yeah. And um, I was, given that the first one was super rare and they had very little data about the individuals who had had that cancer, um, given that it was rare and incurable. And, and then I received a second cancer diagnosis 
to be honest, Stacy, I wasn't sure that I was going to live to see the end of the year. That's mm-hmm. how it felt. Yeah. Um, and I didn't mean to be melodramatic, but you know, the prognosis was just super, super unclear. Yeah. And that was nothing short of terrifying. And I spent a long time being really, really terrified. Um, and just also spent time, you know, uh, doing meditation and yoga and acupuncture and energy work, which I think previously I would have told you, oh, I wasn't sure if I was bought into all of that. Yeah. Yeah. But I really found all of it super helpful and it helped me relax Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of um, focus on healing. I said, you know, if I want my body to interact with this, you know, uh, amazing Western medicine, and I was very lucky, Stacey, I was living in Northern California. I was near a lot of, you know, terrific medical centers and I was treated by Stanford and they were nothing short of spectacular with me. Um, but you know, gosh, um, I, I felt like I needed to relax my body as best I could to accept the Western medicine. And I thought, gosh, yeah, I need to maybe use some of the Eastern practices to help me relax. And once I relaxed, actually what I focused on going forward was if this is the last year of my life, how can I die as gracefully as possible? And that really became my focus. Now, did you, you know, did you feel right away like you wanted to give up or what gave you the strength? What gave you the empowerment inside you to want to succeed and 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 survive instead of getting into a depression and saying, mm. it's it, this is it, I, I'm going to mm. die. And instead you were, I'm going to live. How, yeah. did you, how did you gain that strength inside you? Well, I, I think I've always um, had a force of will. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But I think, you know, I was, I was newly married. I was having this fabulous, fabulous life and was so excited about what the possibilities were. And I think even though I was unsure what the, what the outcome would be, I thought, gosh, um, I, I don't want to just lay down and, and have this take over. I want to fight to the best of my abilities and the way I'm going to be doing doing that is by leaning in to the Eastern practices and then doing everything the doctors told me from a Western medicine standpoint. So I, I did everything they said I should do. And I was super, super lucky in that all of the medicine worked exactly like the doctors wanted it to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I call this uh, the cancer channel one year, two cancers, three miracles. You know, obviously I've just said, you know, it was one year where I was diagnosed with two, I was improbably diagnosed with two cancers. And by the end of the year, I was no evidence of disease for the salivary gland cancer, no evidence of disease for the breast cancer. And while I had been told I would never be able to carry a child, um, two years later, I gave birth to a little girl that we named Rory McDonald, Rory Elizabeth McDonald. Oh, that's wonderful. That is so wonderful. So she's miracle number three. And Stacy, if she were on this podcast with me, she would tell you that she's a miracle. She's now six and six and three quarters. And she would tell you, <laughs> I'm mommy's third miracle. Oh, I love that. I love that. <laughs> you know, I'm one for I I love to hear a happy ending. So this to me is just wonderful. I think one of the things I love is that you incorporated Western medicine you know, with medical, you know, also, because a lot of times there is so many um, contradictions in our society where medical doctors will not like the practice of using alternative methods and Western medicine with medical, you know, and sometimes I, I feel even for myself, combining both actually helped my condition. Now yeah. you, you're saying, you know, that the combination of both helped your condition. You know, I think sometimes it's good to practice, you know, and if you have a situation where you need medical attention from medical doctors, you know, then you have to go because some people, I knew one person who had cancer and just focused on Western medicine and it, it, it didn't work out very well. So sometimes it's good to incorporate 
you know, medical with Western medicaid medicine, you know, and, and, you know, med, um, med Western medicine and Eastern practices. Yes. I, I think that's right. And the way I think of it, Stacy, is the Western medicine was healing my body yes. and the Eastern practices were healing my mind and my soul. Yes. And I know all of that sounds woo woo, but I, <laughs> I am here to tell you that the relief that I was given um, by doing the meditation and the acupuncture, it was palpable for me. Yeah. I, I, in fact, um, and I, and I should, I should own up to the fact that I also went to my breast oncologist, um, after the second, uh, diagnosis. And I said, I am so stressed out. Um, I am in constant fight or flight because I'm so terrified that I will die within a year. I'm in such constant terror that I'm not convinced that I won't die of a heart attack before yeah. one of these two cancers has a chance to kill me. And so I actually said to her, listen, my mental health is suffering. Um, I, I need some anti-anxiety medication and she did prescribe it. And so I was, so I took anti-anxiety medication probably for the first three months post-diagnosis while I developed um, a stronger meditation practice. And eventually I got to the point where I didn't need to tell, take the anxiety medication. And really at that point, um, not only were my Eastern practices um, stronger, uh, but I also, um, my body was reacting super well to all of the chemo and the radiation. And so I had reason, I began to have reason to believe that I, that I could live. I think that is, is amazing. Like, I love that, you know, because I do feel that the Eastern and Western practices actually help with our mental health. And while we still may need medical health you know, and medical help from medical doctors, you know, having those two together combined does a whirlwind of good, you know, yeah. and um, I just, you know, it, your story is truly, truly amazing. Now, if you had to share tips with people on how to cope with cancer yeah. when they're diagnosed, what suggestions would you give to those people? Yeah. So um, the first suggestion I, I always make to individuals is try to understand your diagnosis. Um, and that means, you know, talking with the person who does diagnose you, get, get all of the information that you can, understand what treatment options are available to you. Mm -hmm. And then I suggest go get a second or maybe a third opinion. Have other really smart doctors take a look at your tests, talk with you and explain to you, you know, how they believe your cancer should be treated. I think the the benefit is like doctors are human, right? No, and nobody has the corner on all of the best information or best advice. Right. So um, by going to other doctors, you get other opinions and you also meet other people who you might want to bring on as your doctor rather than the rather than the first person who diagnosed you. This was absolutely, absolutely true in my case. Yes. I started out at one medical center and determined, gosh, I'm not going to be comfortable here. I'm not, uh, I do not enjoy the doctors I'm talking to. So I took my business to Stanford, where I loved every doctor I worked with. Mm -hmm. And I had about 12 that I worked with Stacy. So yeah. that was saying something. But I, I think getting a second or a third opinion is, is really um, wise. And I know that's hard when you have a cancer diagnosis and you're thinking, wow, the clock is ticking, mm -hmm. but I think better to go get the best advice and find the doctor who's going to work best with you. So that's, that's kind of like the one, two, and three, what I suggest people do. Um, you are quite literally putting yourself in this doctor's hands. Yes. So, so make sure you, you trust and like them. And then I, I do suggest that people gather their support around them, determine who it is you want to be on your team, who personally you want to be on your team, because you may need people to go to doctor's appointments with you right. and listen to what the doctor is saying. It is really um, when you have so much adrenaline pump, pumping through you, when you're talking about 
your cancer and your treatment and your mortality, yes. it is hard sometimes to hear everything the doctor is saying. So yeah. I know in my case, I, especially in the early days of my diagnosis, my husband joined every meeting and we we would come to those meetings with all of our questions and I would ask the questions and then my husband, Jeff, would type up the answers on our iPad. And when we would get home, we would review everything the doctors had said. And I was amazed how much I had missed Stacy because you know, I had all of this adrenaline pumping through me. Yeah. Um, you know, often people say, well, I really find it hard to ask help. Um, this is the time to learn <laughs> yes. how to ask for help. Uh, and it turns out the people around you, they are also in crisis. When you're in crisis, they're terrified of losing you. They often feel helpless or th that they have nothing to do. So by asking them to do things like, come to the doctor's appointments with you, drive you to and from, maybe sit with you while you're going through the treatments, that helps them. It, yeah. it helps them feel like they're contributing to your health or to you getting better. So, uh, so I do a lot of suggesting of that. And then finally, and then I, I promise I will let you ask another question. No, Stephanie. Go ahead. Stacey, I, I, um, it is, um, you know, people need to think about their mental health. This is as much, I think, an emotional and a mental journey as it is a physical journey mm -hmm. to get to healthy. So Stacy, I really, I suggest people speak with their doctors about their mental health. And if need be, ask for some medication to help them. You know, right. doctors prescribe pain medication to help with the treatments. Mm -hmm. This is a form of pain. And so uh, I, I think there is no shame or embarrassment in admitting that you are struggling emotionally and mentally. So that that's that's the last piece of advice I'll give in this section with this question. <laughs> now, I know a, a lot of people are embarrassed to go to a therapist or they might be embarrassed to go to a support group. But how do you feel about people maybe talking one on one with someone about going through this or going to a support group where there's other people that can relate to them and maybe see things from a different perspective or just give support? Hey, I'm I'm you're not alone. I'm going through this, too. What do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, I, I think it is person specific. Um, so, uh, and it might al also change over time as the person becomes, um, uh, the person begins to accept the diagnosis. I know in my case, with my initial diagnosis, the salivary gland cancer, I wanted to be super private. Yeah. So you see, I didn't want anyone to know that I had cancer. And in part, it was because at work, I thought, gosh, they will never take another chance on me if they believe that I'm going to die. So, you know, I don't want people to know. You might say, wow, that's silly, but it is how I felt initially. With my second cancer diagnosis, I thought, you know what? All bets are off. <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and I would do better to go very, very public and let everyone know what's going on and ask for the help that I need. But that was, you know, that all happened over a three month period. So my thinking evolved. Um, I didn't ever go to any of the support groups, not while I was going through treatment. And I think it was more, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to emotionally handle what was going through, <laughs> what other people were going through yeah. because I was struggling enough with what I was going through. Yeah. So I didn't do it, but I don't know of a medical center that doesn't have um, you know, a patient support group and, um, and outside of the medical centers, I know like for my breast cancer, I ended up joining a support group a couple of years after I finished treatments, uh, in order to be helpful to people who were going through treatments. Uh, and, and I found it really, uh, made me feel better. I was able to pay it forward to people mm -hmm. and, you know, felt like I was being more helpful yeah. Um, I ended up talking to individuals who I obviously knew and I knew had had salivary gland cancer, yeah. but I did have one girlfriend who had had thyroid cancer. I had another, I, I was young. I was in my early forties. Um, I had another girlfriend who had had breast cancer. So I was able to speak with those individuals and that's what I was comfortable with. Yeah. But yes, I think people need to 
look inside and determine, uh, you know, what it is, what do I need right now? Right. And, and, and seek out what you need because it is as important to seek um, healing for yourself mentally and emotionally as it is to seek healing physically. You know, everybody is different too. You know, everybody right. handles things differently. So what, what, what works for one person may not work for another person. Mm -hmm. And you're not the only person who has told me that they kept it quiet the first time they were diagnosed because they were embarrassed or they didn't yes. want people to think of them differently. They didn't want to be treated differently, yes. but they kept it quiet. And you're not the first person that said that to me. Yeah. What's crazy is the amount of shame and embarrassment associated with a diagnosis that you had nothing to do with. Right. I, I mean, neither of my cancers, I, I, you know, there were no exogenous um, or external factors that the doctors could point to. They said in both cases, we have no idea why you have this. And yeah. you can imagine when a 40 something year old woman has two simultaneous um, cancer diagnoses, the genetics team at Stanford were like, we need some of your blood. We mm -hmm. need to check out what's going on see, to see if there's a larger story and Stacy, I told them, I do not want a larger story. Yeah. Let's keep this con two is enough. Two is enough. And and I was lucky in that so far, uh, two is enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it it is really curious. Um, cancer is still something spoken about in hushed tones, you know, kind of like she has cancer. Um, and I think that is such a shame. Yeah, I think um, it isolates people who have cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, they feel uh, in some cases abandoned by people because they're not comfortable talking beca because their friends and family are not comfortable talking out loud about it. Right. Um, they're not comfortable talking out loud about it because of the shame or the embarrassment. And, and some of the embarrassment is about your own mortality. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, and, and there seems to be this, you know, cancer is not contagious. So, you know, I, I think rather than people stepping away from a cancer patient, they need to lean in and support and surround that person. So one of the things I am hopeful of in, in um, writing this book, I hope to help people talk more openly and honestly and transparently with one another about cancer, right. both personally and in the workplace, yeah. in the workplace. I'm, I've actually spoken at a number of companies now and have scheduled some other uh, meetings uh, where companies are bringing me in to talk about my experience, both as a human, as well as as an employee. What is it like? Um, how would you like your uh, coworkers to treat you? How, how should a manager uh, deal with an employee who suddenly has a cancer diagnosis or really any sort of health crisis. Like, how do you handle that? Yeah. So I, I am doing a lot of that talking and I hope I am adding my voice to that larger conversation. That's wonderful. You know, because when people hear other people talk about it and they hear how they overcame it and they can hear one-on-one -on -one advice of how you can see it from a, from a um, coworker's uh, point of view versus um, a person who's actually going through it. And, right. you know, it, you could actually give some insight and, and teach them how they can handle it and the best ways to talk to them and the right words to say and the right words not to say, you know, and because sometimes, you know, people don't want, you know, empathy. Just say the wrong thing. Yeah. You know, and especially the person going through it, you don't want people to feel sorry for you and, or whisper, she has cancer. You know, right. you know, those are the worst yeah. things you could do. You want pe you want to be treated just like everybody else. And if people, you know, put out mm -hmm. their help, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm here for you. It, that's the, the, I think one of the best things that you could hear from somebody is just to say, I'm here for you. If you need anything, I'm here. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that um, when you are going through a health crisis like cancer, you, you so desire some normalcy in your yeah. life because everything else is is so crazy out of whack. Right. Uh, so where friends can be really helpful is just coming and hanging out and talking about talking about the cancer, 
but not talking about the cancer too. Like yeah. talking about other things, even like os- office gossip, that's helpful because yeah. it just gets your, your mind off it. Right. And, and Stacey, to your, to your point about people feeling awkward about what to say, my best advice to anyone who has a friend or a family member or coworker who is going through a crisis, any sort of crisis, is to say, you know, look at them very sincerely and say, I am so sorry you are going through this. It must be hard. Right. And that's all you need to say. I like it. It just, it, it very directly shows the person. I see you. I hear you. I acknowledge that it must be hard. And then, and then step back and let that invitation sit in the air between you. And if that person wants to talk about, talk about it, he or she will. If they don't want to talk about it, respect that, respect that, but, but letting them know, you know, and, and I think it's okay to say, I am terrified of saying the wrong thing to you. What I want you to know is that I love you. And if I can be helpful, I'd like to be. That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, that's, that's it. And, and as I like to say to people is, you know, what's helpful bringing over a pint of ice cream. (laughs) <laughs> just any time of the day or night, you know, um, there for, for me, when I was going through my, uh, my treatments, um, for the salivary gland cancer, I was receiving radiation, but the breast oncologist wanted to start treating me for the breast cancer at the same time. Like everybody's like, Hey, we gotta, we gotta hit this now. Yeah. So I was doing the radiation to the mouth at the same time that I was doing chemo for wow. the breast. And Stacy, I don't know if you know that, but uh, if you know it, but chemo intensifies radiation. So it oh, meant man. that in week two of my six week protocol for the mouth radiation, they were seeing symptoms that they normally see a week or so after you finish radiation. Oh, wow. Radiation compounds, right? And um so my mouth had started bleeding. I was starting to develop sores in wow. my mouth and, and it just got worse from there. Like at, at the, what I like to refer to at the apex of the pain, I had 21 sores in my mouth and it was like my mouth had been sunburned. So I didn't eat for about three or four weeks. Um, and my friend, Paul, who owns a small ice cream um, company on the East Coast, East coast called Adirondack creamery, Paul (laughs) overnighted. Um, I think it was six pints of ice cream to me so that I had something to eat. And, um, that was, that was amazing because Paul is amazing. Um, (laughs) and I'm super lucky that he owned an ice cream company, but, but my understanding is with the internet, you can find other ice cream companies (laughs) overnight ice cream, but I will put in a little plug for Adirondack Creamery. (laughs) (laughs) It was, it was tremendous. It was just great to have ice cream. Oh my gosh. That's so wonderful. I love that. And (laughs) you know, it was how long after the, the, you had the radiate, you had the radiation, you had the chemo and then how long was it after that, after they got rid of the cancer from your body, was it that the miracle came and your daughter was born? Oh yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the year, uh, you know, and this was 2012 and I went through cancer treatments really for a full calendar year. At the end of that year, I was, as I said earlier, no evidence of disease for either of the cancers. And two years post-treatment, I was going back to visit with my breast oncologist. And my my breast oncologist um, likes to see me quarterly. So I visit with her and her team four times a year. Mm -hmm. And and they are lovely. So it is fine. And we have developed um, lovely friendships. Um, But two years post-treatment, I went back uh, for my two-year checkup. And I said to her, you know, we were going through fertility treatments um, prior to cancer. And she said, Oh, I remember. She said, I I remember that is one of the toughest conversations I've ever had with a patient, Sarah. I, um, it was really tough to tell you that you would not be able to carry a child. And I said, yep. I said, here we are two years past and I'm beginning to feel optimistic that I might live. Um, you know, so Jeff and I have our embryos, 
um, you know, on ice. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're looking into surrogacy uh, because I won't be able to carry the baby. We're looking into surrogacy. And my doctor said, oh my God, I'm so glad you bring this up. She said, there has just been a study in Europe where they followed German and Belgian women who had breast cancer and who were on the medication I was on, who willfully took themselves off their medications, got pregnant, and then went back on their medications and they didn't have higher incidence of, of recurrence. Wow. And, and so she said, Sarah, I would monitor you through the pregnancy and I would see you monthly. So she said, if you want to have a baby, let's do it. And so, so Stacey, wow. So I, at this point I was, um, I was 48. So I gave birth to my little girl, um, Rory at 48. That is amazing. Oh my amazing. gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> that is so amazing. Now you spoke about how it, how, how you having cancer changes you the mm -hmm. aftermath. Of mm -hmm. when, after you go through all this, you yeah. have your miracle life is, is a grand, you know, you're at the top of your game, but it, it, I hear from many people that you start to look at life differently. You start to feel differently. How was going through this whole traumatic event, but ending up in a, in a, a very happy note, how did it change you as a person or did it change you as a person? Yeah, I, I think I've always been, you know, high energy and uh, an optimistic person. But I remember one of the conversations that I had with a girlfriend when I was first diagnosed, she said to me, you know, Sarah, um, you and I are the same in that we both know that we're going to die. She said, but you actually believe it. And I thought that was profound. That is profound. And I, I, I and, and that's, what I think is different is that I live understanding that life is precious. Yes. And short. yes. Life is precious and short. So Stacy, as one cancer patient said to me, she said, yes, Sarah, life is precious and short. So we must do what is in our hearts. Yes. That was also profound. That is. Profound. And, and so that is how I live now. Um, and, and I, I don't know that I didn't, I, I feel like I leaned into life and lived fully, but I think I am more aware and present now. And while I've always loved people, I am an extrovert, um, a self-proclaimed extrovert. Uh, now I understand there is nothing more important than your relationships. Nothing, yes. nothing. When I was diagnosed, all I wanted to do was be with my husband, be with my family, and be with my close friends. And I actually developed some really, really close friendships during that year of cancer. You mm -hmm. know, it intensified my relationships with people. And so I, I really lean in on relationships. I prioritize them above work. And I have to admit that didn't always happen. Right. You know, I felt like I had a very, very important job uh, and um, that I couldn't let people down. Uh, but now I recognize it is as important, if not more important, that I don't let the people, the people who are around me personally, I don't want to let them down. Right. So I prioritize people above all else. That's wonderful. I like that because sometimes people in our world and especially in our society, we get so wrapped up in making money, finances, this, that, you know, paying the bills, you know, when's my next mortgage payment? Where is it coming from that we lose sight on what's really important? We worry so much about meaningless things and we, f we forget what really brings true happiness in our life. And it's the people around us, the people who we love and care for nature. When we go outside and take a deep breath and we see those beautiful flowers and trees. And yeah. I, I think that's so profound. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I am obviously not the person, first person who has said this, but you can spend a lot of time worrying about the future and guess what? You're, <laughs> uh, you will not have control over what will happen in the future. Um, what you can do is be very, very present right now and um, just try to be present with your people and your experiences, et cetera, and uh, certainly prepare for the future, but don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. 
Yes, I that is a great piece of advice. I I think people should really listen to that and take that to heart. I think just that piece of advice alone is very valuable. Now you so what I would say is don't get it. <laughs> you don't have to have cancer in order to come to that epiphany. Uh, so I do not recommend anyone gets cancer. <laughs> <laughs> but just just live and love your life. Yes. Yeah. I think that's beautiful. I think that's that that that's one thing people should do is is just live life and and not worry so much about those meaningless things, you know, because we don't know what the next day may bring. Nobody does, whether you have cancer or not. We don't know what the next we just assume we'll be here, but we don't know what the next day will bring. Right. Actually, most of us assume we are immortal. Yes, it's very true. Now you wrote a book that I want to hear a little bit about. I, you know, I want um, this book. It, it, it seems like a wonderful book. So I want you to tell everybody a little about it. Yeah. Um, so the book is called The Cancer Channel. And as I said earlier today, it was the title comes from when you first get a cancer diagnosis, it feels like there is a channel turned on your head that plays all cancer all the time. Right. So what I found is when I was initially uh, diagnosed um, I tried to research cancer and understand, um, how I might do it best, yeah. how, how, um, uh, how I could ensure that I would be as successful as possible in my outcome. And I found a ton of books that were written by doctors explaining why cancer happens or what their hypotheses are for what, what happens yes. and what tor- cor- sorts of treatments were available. But what I didn't find is books that kind of uh, explained what the lived experience was for a cancer patient. What does it feel like the first day you go in for radiation? What does it feel like to have chemo coursing through your veins? So I wrote the book as, um, a guidebook of sorts for the newly diagnosed for those who have cancer so that they could read the stories, hopefully see some of their experience in it, Mm -hmm. um, have that resonate with them. And maybe they would feel a little less alone. So that was the initial goal. Um, And I spent a long time writing it, trying to get it right. Yeah. Um, And, and in fact, I had a girlfriend who had stage four cancer. She asked if she could read one of the early versions of the book. And she said, gosh, Sarah, you're a great writer. She said, you're always so funny. She said, but you know what? Your book's not honest. Mm. And that gave me pause. I said, wow, why do you say that? And she said, well, you know, you're writing about the funny stuff that happened and some of the awkward stuff that happens. She's like, if you really want to write about what it's like to have cancer, you need to write about the days that you are prone on the floor, sobbing, despairing that you might die. And she said, and I know you've had those days because I have those days. And she said, and if you want to write for cancer patients, you have to write about that too. So Stacey, I I went back and rewrote vast parts of the book based upon her uh, feedback. And and sadly, uh, she never saw the final version of the book because she, she died. Um, but, uh, that's, that's what I was trying to do in the writing of the book. Um, I I've received just amazing feedback from people who have cancer, um, about reading the book and how it does resonate, but perhaps even more surprising is the number of friends and family who have said to me, wow, um, I read this and gosh, my brother is going through cancer and I had no idea that this is what he was feeling. Thank you because I'm going to show up differently. Wow. And so, so that, um, that was pretty remarkable and comments like that just make, you know, the 10 years it took me to write the book, every minute was worth it to receive feedback like that. And now I'm just trying to get the book into the hands of more people and just continue the conversation. That's amazing. Oh, I, you know, thank you so much for, for doing that, because I think, so many people are going to benefit from that because I think in our society, we have so many books written by doctors and we ha- t- they talk about the diagnosis, they talk about the causes, they talk about the treatments, but they don't talk about 
what it's like on the patient's perspective. And a lot of those books are written in medical terminology that go over a person's head if they're not a medical doctor. Yeah. And we need people like you who can actually talk from a patient perspective and actually have other people realize, hey, I'm not alone. There's someone who's feeling just like me and then give advice in the book or talk about what you did that might actually help another person light bulb go up and say, wow, you know what? I didn't think about that. Maybe I should try that. Maybe that will help me get out of my depression. Maybe that will help me, you know, not cry every day and, and sob, you know, maybe it'll help me move forward. So books like yeah. yours go a long way. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, you raised another issue that I was thinking about. I've had a number of doctors read the book and to a person <laughs> like the, it's, it's like over a dozen doctors at this point who have said to me, unprompted, this should be required reading for doctors Yes, so that we understand the patient experience. And yes. in fact, one of those doctors, I, like, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it, but she's, she's the head of palliative care at a medical center. Yeah. Um, and she has made it required reading for the fourth year medical students. Excellent. And um, has asked me to come speak at that medical center um, to the doctors, to the professors. Um, and I cannot begin to tell you, Stacy, how excited I am about that. Um, uh, and I, I've also, I my salivary gland cancer has an amazing support group called the Adenoid Cystic Carcinoma Organization International. And the board of that uh, patient advocacy group has asked me to become the patient advocate for that group. And so I'm going to be speaking at a number of medical conferences this next year. And Excellent. I, oh man, I cannot believe it. I'm, I am so excited to have this opportunity. You know, I, that's one of the biggest thing I hear from, from um, patients is that my doctor doesn't understand what I'm going through. And they say that very angrily. And the doctor's like, well, I may not understand what you're going through, but I can help you from, I can help you, you know, medically, but yeah. you know what? It would be nice if the doctor could read a book like that, every doctor for, in every condition and be able to understand what that patient is going through emotionally and physically. And so I, I will tell you, Stacy, that my oncology nurse was diagnosed with breast cancer two years ago mm -hmm. and was very private about it. Um, and she shared with me um, she's like, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. I talk to cancer patients every single day, breast cancer patients, but I didn't know until I was diagnosed what it was like. Yeah. And that for me, I, and, and I'm, I am so sorry that she had to go through it, but for me, it made me think, yeah, I, I want everybody to read a book like this, or I want, yeah. I want for doctors to hear from patients, right? Just, you know, what it, what it feels like. So. I think that's very important because then they would be able to relate better and yeah. they would be able to communicate better because they would have a better perspective of what's going through that, that patient when they are diagnosed with, with cancer or any condition, because then they can understand what they're going through emotionally, physically, yeah. you know, what's going through their, their mind and body. And they would be able to actually grow a better bond and be able to actually build that trust and build that 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 relationship that would benefit both the patient and the doctor. Yep, help them both to thrive. Yes. Now, where can we find your book? So, um, my book is actually available um, at local bookstores. They would have to they would have to order it. Um, they would have to order it, but it's it's available there. It's also available on Amazon. That's actually Great. where I initially launched it. I self published it mm -hmm. um, because uh, when I did try to shop it out to a couple of publishers, and I, I really don't know too many people in the publishing industry, but most said to me, um, you know, gosh, you're actually neither famous nor infamous. <laughs> so not, not likely that we would take a bet on your memoir, no matter how compelling it is or how well written it is. Um, you know, we just, uh, they need to sell books. So they said you should self-publish. So I did. Um, so I self-published and then I launched it on Amazon. You can get it, um, you know, paperback, hardcover or Kindle on Amazon. And actually this next month, I am thinking about doing an audiobook uh, because Excellent. I have had 
many requests from very busy people who say, you know, when I commute, uh, when I work out, I, li I listen to podcasts or I listen to audiobooks. Would you please uh, make an audiobook? So I am looking into that. Excellent. Excellent. I love it. I love it. Now tell us your website. Where can people go for your website? Yeah, it's called the cancerchannelbook.com. And on the Cancer Channel book, I have excerpts from the book. Um, so written excerpts, but I also do, I also read uh those excerpts. So if you want, if you want to hear me read those excerpts, it's on on the uh website. Uh there are also endorsements from people who have read it. Uh there are links to the podcasts that I've been on. So I place those on my website. And if individuals wanted to book me for a podcast or if they wanted to bring me into their corporation or their medical conference to talk about this, you can contact me um, on the website. It's Sarah at the cancer channel book.com or just go to the website. Excellent. You know, this has been an amazing conversation, Sarah. I'm so glad that you could actually share your stories and, you know, that miracles are, are there. You had two rare forms of cancer in one year. You went through all this trauma. You took a trauma and you turned it into a positive event where you actually were able to give birth to a child. You were able to have a family. And now you're using your experiences to teach others and advocate that is in, in, in an area where it is so needed. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I wish you a ton of success. And I hope that, you know, you continue on your journey to change in lives because people need, we need, the world needs more people like you. Oh, Stacy, so kind. This has been a tremendous conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, really you're very welcome. It. Oh, very, you're very welcome. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. You as well.